Nigel is a local attorney, a graduate of Ohio State University. Uh, you left North Carolina and went up to Ohio State, Yankee territory. Came back down and earned your law degree at uh, NC, at uh, University of North Carolina at Ch Chapel Hill. And now you're practicing here in immigration and civil rights cases. Correct. Welcome to the Meeting House. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to start by talking about what happened at Shaw University earlier this year. Shaw University is a, a very prominent, well-known uh, black, uh, historically black school in downtown uh, Raleigh, uh, launched in 1865, uh, was the first uh, black university in the South to start teaching after the Civil War. And, uh, but something happened there earlier this year that made the news. That's how I, re I read about it. Tell us what happened. So we started protesting because we were not allowed to be back on the university's mosque that has been there for the last 40 years. Now who is we? So officially Meshit King Khalid, that's the actual nonprofit that's been operating out of the mosque since 2005. And they 2003, operate, I'm sorry. And they, there is a mosque on the campus of Shaw University. This is very unusual. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how that got started. So back in the 1980s, you had a very large population of people from the Muslim world coming to Shaw University to study. And there was a need for a mosque because of the group of Muslims that were there. So how did this happen, that these Muslim students came to Shaw University? Why did it happen? So many just wanted to have an education in the United States. And at that time at Shaw University, there was a Department of Islamic Studies and International Studies headed by a Muslim professor. And so they, most of these students were international students. Mm -hmm. They came to Raleigh, North Carolina to study at Shaw because they had an Islamic Studies program. That itself is unusual, even stunning. Mm -hmm. What happened to that program? So. The official response is funding was the reason why the program no longer exists. We're very common about, in colleges. Very common, especially historically black colleges right. too, which we understand. And so it was the early 2000s in which the program officially went defunct due to lack of funding. But there, the mosque stayed there on the campus. So describe this mosque. Was it just a converted room or was it its own building? Well, the interesting thing is the entire building was actually not just a mosque, but also classrooms and offices for the university's use. The mosque itself is located on the second level. It's a very large room, very open. It accommodates about 306 people, according to the fire department. That's their maximum capacity. And, but the actual building itself was the International and Islamic Studies building. Now it's just the International Studies building. How was the building funded? Was it built with funding from the Muslim world? Correct. So the largest donation actually came from the Saudi royal family back in the really? early 1980s. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the building? So the international, uh, it was the International and Islamic Studies, but that's just the International Studies building. And so the mosque is on the second floor. It had been used for 40 years then as a center for prayer and worship. Correct. By most accounts, it's the oldest mosque in the city of Raleigh proper that was used by both the community and also students at the university. Has it been in continuous use? Continuous use until March 2020. The COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, was the whole campus shut down or just the mosque? So the whole campus was shut down like many campuses in the country. And uh, does it have an imam? It does have an imam. Mm -hmm. A full-time person or is it somebody has a wider ministry in the area? He's a part-time imam. Yes, he has a nine to five gig, but he also tries to work at the mosque part-time. So along with everything else, it was shut down. So what was the controversy? Well, the controversy was when everything started to reopen, we were still closed. And the official reason that we were given was COVID up until February of this year. That's the only reason we were given as to why it was closed. Now, I assume that there was Christian worship going on on the, on the campus. Oh, there's an historic chapel on Shaw's campus, and that was open to the public. And, and those worship services had restarted, mm -hmm. but not the mosque. Correct. Why do you think this was? So it's hard to say it wasn't discrimination if, you know, the chapel was open, but the mosque was closed. 
But then in the background was the university's plans to redevelop its property for financial gain. And that's what made us think it was maybe a financial incentive or motive behind closing the mosque for good. So, so how did you get involved? You're not a graduate. Correct. You're not on the board there. Well, the board of the mosque I am. Yeah. You're on the board of the mosque, I see. <laughs> not the university, of course. But, but so this is what got you involved. So I actually started back in 2013. Um, the leader of the board at that time called our law firm. And it just so happens that my boss went to Sunday school at that mosque way back in the day. And he needed to help when it comes to the internal operations and also negotiating with the university. Yeah. Now, when you say that your boss, that is at the law firm, mm -hmm. went to Sunday school, you know, I hear that as a, as a Christian, but you're talking about, you're talking about Muslim mm -hmm. teaching. Correct. And he was a participant in that mosque in their regular Sunday school mm -hmm. on Sunday. Correct. And you got involved, you went to see him, and tell me, tell me what happened. Yeah, so the leader of the board at that time, his name is Khalil Fahimuddin. He said, we need some help when it comes to just our internal operations and also negotiating with the university about our use. There have been some challenges over the years, and the idea was to have some kind of formal agreement, which never existed, that described our rights versus the university's rights. So what did you do? What did they want you to do? So we met with the university. We also worked with the mosque itself just to kind of, you know, instruct people how to run a nonprofit organization, you know, what a president does, what a secretary does, and so forth. You got involved as an attorney or as a board member? So first attorney, then board member. Yeah. I got roped in. You got roped into it? <laughs> <laughs> and how did things play out? So it was productive. We started negotiating with the university to get something that was definitive, something that was on paper as to how we can get access to the building. If we have to be there for our early morning prayers, can we get a key? Simple things like that. And a part of the issue is there was no formal agreement between the mosque goers and the university when the facility was first built. And so without a written agreement then, we're kind of you know, holding our hands now saying, well, what do we do at this point? And that was the intention behind our efforts back in that time in 2013 and onward. I want to assume that the original worshipers were largely students connecting with the university. So, inter it, inter so we were students, but then over time what you saw is the population became more locals. Mm -hmm. Because little by little the students started to go elsewhere and the local Muslim population increased as well. So people like my boss who grew up in this community, that was the first mosque that they went to. So it was initially mostly students, but then some locals, then about 50-50, and now it's definitely a lot more locals and students. Uh, describe for me the Muslim community in Raleigh. Extremely diverse. So a big part of it is with all the universities that we have, the big three, so Duke, UNC, NC State, you've had a lot of people come to study, and then based on that, they end up staying, getting jobs, establishing families. So that's what we call the immigrant Muslim experience mm -hmm. here. Then you also have what they, some people say the indigenous Muslim experience, mm -hmm. which might be a misleading term. It describes people like myself, African Americans who, you know, our ancestors were brought to the United States, found Islam later. And so we have a large African American Muslim population too. So it's pretty representative of many major cities in the U.S. And, and it's drawn from the wide diversity of the Muslim population around the world. Absolutely. So tell me about your journey uh, with your Muslim faith. When did this start? So early, I would say, elementary school even. You know, my parents, they always raised myself and my siblings to believe in one God and that was it. They themselves were raised Christian, but like a lot of people, they kind of adopted the belief of spirituality versus mm -hmm. organized religion. Mm -hmm. very a common. very common thing. Very common. Right? And so growing up looking at different religions, Islam, I was really attracted to it specifically when it comes to its interpretation of what we call in Arabic Tawheed or monotheism. Mm -hmm. um, their explanation was very simple and just really spoke to me. Um, because the whole Trinitarian idea is very complex. Correct. At an intellectual level and even at a, at a lay level. And how old were you when, when this transition was going on in your life? You know, if I look back, little by little, it just kind of came to me like I was in fifth grade we did this thing in our you know, social studies class where everyone had to select at random a famous African-American to be for a day. And then the parents would come in, it was like a museum that you walk through, who are you? And lo and behold, I chose Malcolm X. So based on that, I started studying a little bit more about his life. 
In seventh grade, my dad purchased a movie for DVD because they were all the rage back then, you know, DVDs. Young people now don't know what those are, of course, but uh, it was called The Message, and it was a movie about the starting of the Islamic faith. And an old movie, but I still was really drawn to it. And then through college, talking to friends, went to Ohio State, and I was actually going there to study Arabic and international studies. My goal was to be an agent for the government, and Arabic was a critical language, and that was kind of my goal. Um, one of my professors was Muslim, an Arabic language, and he said, you know, we have this thing called a halakha, like a circle where you study. Because I was talking to my, my beliefs, and at that point, I was already really Muslim without really knowing it. And so I went to that event, learned from different people there, it was mainly geared towards other converts to Islam. Thought about it more, and then the following March, March 2nd, 2006, I embraced Islam. And when you say you embraced it, describe that event for me. Yeah, it happened to be a lecture about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And at after, the university? At the university. And who gave this lecture? Was it somebody connected to the university? So he was a member of the university's Muslim Student Association. It's a national organization, but with many chapters throughout different colleges, um, so MSA as they call it. And he gave a speech about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His name was Asif. And after the lecture, I was talking to a, a guy that I had met at that study circle I went to the previous you know, November. And he was asking me, well, what are you waiting for? And I said, well, I want to learn everything there is to learn about Islam. And he said, well, you'll never learn everything about anything. And I said, that's a good point. And so, very good point. Yeah, I made the decision right then and there to embrace Islam. And so what did you do when you said you embraced Islam? What did you do? In the Christian world, of course, we get baptized. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the conversion process. So it's similar in that, well, the first thing you do is a testament of faith. You say in Arabic, La ilaha illallah wa Muhammadan Rasulullah. There's mm -hmm. no God worthy of worship but mm -hmm. Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. And my writing saying this is one of the five pillars of Islam. Correct, the first one. Mm -hmm. Right. And then after you do that, actually, you do a full bath later on at home. So I guess it's similar. We call it a uh, ghusl, a full bath, but it's a type of ablution as well. Functions very similar to our baptism, but it's done in private. Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, did, did you announce this to somebody? So it does have to be public, the announcement. Um, and so I was at that lecture. There was a bunch of people there, of course. And so, you know, there were a lot of Muslims there. It was a Muslim Student Association event. So it was public in that sense, of course. By that, you mean you got up and made an announcement that you had just uh, confessed Muhammad, peace be upon him? Oh, yeah. There's a brother named Aus, and he basically led me in the actual... Um, reciting of the, mm -hmm. the testament of faith. Right. And then afterwards, everyone says, Allahu Akbar, God mm -hmm. is great. And right. then people are congratulating you, they're hugging you, they're shaking your hand. So, Do they give gifts or did they take you out to eat and that sort of thing? Or? So I did get a gift. It was a box set of books and it included a translation of the Quran, mm -hmm. um, a book about narrations of what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, a biography of the Prophet Muhammad. And then after that, a lot of my friends from college became my college friends. You know, I, I grew up a very you know, conservative upbringing in that I just had good friends in high school. We didn't drink, we didn't smoke. Here in Charlotte. In Charlotte, Charlotte. yeah. And then going to college, you just see a bunch of things. And yeah. so it was really the right time to kind of get a good net of friends who would kind of keep me on the straight path and not very often do the things that people typically find themselves doing in university. Uh, what did your parents think about this? So they were very open in terms of the religion itself. Right, but their main... And, yeah. They were still at least nominally Christian. I would say they would probably call themselves just a theist, really. Theist. Yeah. Um, Which, of course, yeah. Muslims are, mm -hmm. Christians are, Jews are as well. Exactly. And I mean, we would go to church, but only on certain occasions, funerals, weddings. And my parents even will go to church here and there, but my dad is like, yeah, I just kind of like the spiritual message that comes with it, you know. Um, but for them, really, it was just a matter of, you know, post 9-11 America, caring for their son and understanding that it could be something that would be an impediment to my safety, you know, with the backlash that people were seeing after 9-11 and so forth. Um, so it was really a concern for a son, which I appreciate. Now, here we are again in the middle of a war that pits, to a large extent, the Muslim world, or at least part of the Muslim world against Israel. Uh, what kind of impact does this have on the Muslim community in Raleigh? So it's a huge impact, right? And so a big part of the issue that we see 
is all of the pain and suffering that you've seen this past week. For a lot of people, the main chief complaint is that this is suffering that has been felt for more than 100 years now on the you know, side of the Palestinians. And sadly, a lot of the attention you know, is going to the events of the last week when a much bigger conversation needs to be had about the events of the last 100 years. That's very well said. So w when this happened, uh, now 12 days ago, uh, what, what did the Muslim community in Raleigh do? There were definitely a lot of protests and solidarity for the struggle of Palestinian people. Public protests? Public protests, absolutely. Yeah. And so a big part of it is you know, just understanding that for all the people who are suffering, and Gaza especially, and what's going through, and the feeling of people in this situation, in a bad situation where they're basically being attacked, not because they themselves did anything, but because maybe people amongst them did. Yeah. You're talking about the people in Gaza who are, who are being attacked. Did you all experience any hostility uh, from the wider community here in Raleigh? Fortunately not. Yeah, things here have been relatively peaceful. Um, I haven't heard of any incidents. The process I was at this past weekend, no incidents whatsoever. Sadly, across the country, I mean, things are happening, of course, but at least here things have been very civil. The, um, your community here, um, are any of them Palestinian? Oh, quite a few. Oh, yeah. So they would have friends, relatives, and families uh, who may be touched by all of this? Yes. Uh, have you been interviewed by the media to, to talk about this? No. Yeah, I have not. Um, at the last protest I was at, friends of mine were interviewed by the media. Um, want people who are a lot more connected with the actual organization of the protests mm -hmm. and Palestinians themselves. You know, me personally, I can relate to the issue as a Muslim. Um, the issue regarding the Palestinian struggle, what's going on in Jerusalem, it's the third holiest city in Islam, so it right. does mean a lot to Muslims worldwide. Right. And when you look at many black liberation movements throughout history, there's a lot of affiliation to the Palestinian struggle. There's a lot of commonalities. Um, but ultimately, of course, a person who's actually Palestinian, they're much more equipped, and they have much more of a right to speak on behalf of that struggle than I do. And of course, there are many Palestinians who are Christians, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the puzzling things about this outpouring of Christian endorsement of the Israeli attack when in fact uh, the Christians in the area, most of them are Palestinian. Correct. And um, I, it's a puzzle why more Christians in America don't identify with the, with the Christians as well as those who are, as you say, been uh, without a homeland, without self-determination. How much of, uh, of this uh, lack of opportunity and self-determination is a function of Israeli politics versus the wider Arabic mm -hmm. politics. Why is it that the, the wider Arabic and Muslim co community is not coming to the aid of Gaza? That's a very good question because it's one thing here in the United States. I see so much solidarity amongst Muslims who are not Palestinian, right. um, Muslims of all different walks of life, from all different countries, all different backgrounds. One justification when it comes to Arab leaders and Arab countries I've heard, where you have refugee camps right. where Palestinians have been living for generations, right. is that if you assimilate them into the larger society and their countries, they'll lose their identities as Palestinians and they'll not be able to make it back to their homeland. At the same time, they're talking about normalizing relations, though, with Israel. And in the process of doing so, I don't really hear any plans of Palestinians having the right to return to their native homes. So you just can't have it both ways, right? And so a lot of Palestinians who I speak with who made their way to Raleigh, they didn't come directly from Palestine. As we know, they came from other you know, countries or refugee camps. And they'll tell me, they'll say, you know, a lot of times we got worse treatment in other Arab countries. Mm -hmm. And it's just sad. It know. is sad. The, um, are you all preparing here in Raleigh to receive new 
refugees. Yeah, so fortunately in this area, we've seen a lot of refugees come through, right? And so from all over uh, the world or from the Muslim world? All over the world, yeah. So the Triangle area specifically, they've been very welcoming, be it in Raleigh, nearby Chapel Hill, and Durham. Um, there's a really good Syrian family that we befriended who ended up making their residence in Durham right around 2016, if I'm not mistaken, 2017 when the fighting in Syria got really bad. Mm -hmm. So in this area specifically, refugee resettlement is pretty strong. And so I don't see any reason why that would slow down if we get more Palestinian refugees. Um, but the immigration process of that basically involves the first making to a refugee camp. And I don't think the Gazans have that ability at this point, sadly. Now, professionally, you are a immigration attorney. What is the primary focus of your work as a immigration attorney? So we do all types of immigration cases, but family-based is probably the most common thing that we see. What do you mean by that? So you're a U.S. citizen, you have a green card, and you want to apply for your parent to immigrate to the U.S., or your spouse to immigrate to the U.S., or your child to do the same, um, or your sibling. You know, that's probably the most common case that we do. There are other cases where something horrible has happened in your country, or you are being persecuted in your country of origin, so you want to stay in the U.S. as an asylee. We do those cases as well. Now, when you say this is the most common situation, what is your role as an attorney in dealing with this issue in, in, a, in a particular case? Oh, so people will come to us for a consultation, and the first thing is we do evaluate if they have a case or not. Um, a lot of people don't have cases, you know. Which means they don't, uh, they don't have a green card or uh, they, they're not, uh, why wouldn't they have a case? Yeah, what would be an example of somebody who comes to you that does not have a case? So a really good example is a lot of people wanting to do asylum, but they're talking about relatives who are overseas. Very common thing we see. And to do an asylum case, you have to be here to say, I would be persecuted where I come from. Mm -hmm. You can't really do an asylum case from another country. So that's one very common thing that we see, for example. And they have to prove that they have this status and that they have this condition in their home, home country. Now, you're not, your work is not limited to Muslims. Correct. It, it, you, could, you could be serving the whole range of religious people or non-religious people who come. Mm -hmm. um, the, do you get in, have you gotten involved in the immigration issue on the southern border of the United States? So a little bit we have, just based on the fact that for those who come to the southern border, some are making their way to this area as well. And we get those cases, and we haven't done too much work on them recently, only because you come and you get a court date two, three years from now. So we'll have a consultation, but in terms of the actual work that we do in the case, it's not as much just because of how backlogged the court is. So there are immigration judges in Raleigh. Charlotte, that's the closest uh, court. <laughs> closest court. So you have to go to Charlotte and your clients have to go to Charlotte who with you. Um, how many of these hearings in Charlotte would you have, let's say, in a three-month period? Oh, not many. Yeah. So between how backlogged the court is, and we don't really see as many deportation cases as other firms that are in Charlotte, for example, I would say I'm probably doing five hearings a year at this point. Five hearings a year for deep deportation, mm -hmm. and these could be anybody, not just Muslims. Correct. What do you see as the future of the Muslim community in Raleigh? I think it's growing. I mean, the reality is the Muslim community in Raleigh, it's largely, I mean, there are people like myself, of course, you know, but then there are many people who immigrated, mm -hmm. and it's a good place to be. And I always ask people, why did you choose Raleigh, North Carolina? And they say, well, the schools are good. Cost of living is good. A lot of good housing options. The same reason why my parents came from the north to. And the lawyers are good. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can take credit for that a little bit, I guess. But I guess, yeah. I guess you can. <laughs> but I mean, you know, overall, I, I see it growing just because the general population is growing from both people from other countries and other parts of the country. Do you find the Muslim community here has good, generally good re relations with the Christian community? Oh yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of really good interfaith, you know, programs that we see locally. Um, the largest mosque is not too far away from here. 
there's yearly an open house that they have once they invite people from different faith-based communities to come. So I've never really seen anything bad between different communities of different religions. Well, that's a pretty, pretty strong statement uh, and speaks well both for the Islamic community as well as the Christian and Jewish community. Is there any friction between the Jewish community and the Islamic community in Raleigh? No. Yeah, there's one friend of mine who does a lot of good interfaith work. His name is Faisal Khan. He's actually at a rally right now for Palestine. And he's done a lot of good work with different religious organizations of those who practice Judaism. And, you know, the one thing that he says that's pretty consistent is they don't get too into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know. Um, but overall, I mean, there's a lot of commonalities between the two different religions. I had a lunch with, you know, a couple a few months ago and they're having an event called a Cedar next mm -hmm. year and they want us to come out to it. Right. And, and I mentioned to him, I said, you know, ultimately, you know, there's a lot of commonalities between us and you. I mean, we both like the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, of course, yeah. but I asked him straight out, I mean, how do you feel about Palestinian rights? You know, and they mentioned their support of a two-state solution and they want to start the conversation and that's better than not having the conversation at all. What role do you foresee for yourself in this, um, this uh, interreligious dialogue about uh, global justice issues. Yeah. What would you like to do? The biggest thing I want to do is just kind of connect the dots, right? And when it comes to the things that I see done to the Palestinians, it is really hard not to make me think of the way things were in the United States for black people. Right. I remember watching a New York Times piece about the settlements, and it was by a lady who lived in Tel Aviv, so she's kind of removed from the issue. And she went to a settlement and mentioned how there are Palestinians who get work permits to build homes in neighborhoods they can never live in. And it immediately made me think of Wait a time. Wait a minute. Say that again. They get w permits to build homes in communities that they can never live in. Settlements, yeah. Settlements. Okay. And made me immediately think of a time here where, as black people, we could go to white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We could raise people's kids, work mm -hmm. on their lawns. We can never live in those can neighborhoods. Never live there. So, as those connections, I just really want people to think about, and then based on that, we can try to find solutions to these common problems that I think are overshadowed a lot of times. Nigel, thank you for being in the meeting house tonight. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Thank it, you so much. It's been been very interesting talking to you about these things. God bless you as a Christian to a Muslim in your work. May it prosper. And may you have opportunity to be a person of great influence in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come back. Absolutely. Come back again. Thank you. Thank you.